the whole culture of South by is just a is just really really fun. I always inevitably also run into like a thousand people that I know. I get to run into all kinds of people that I don't get to see that often. Uh, I get to eat great food, watch great movies, um, and then to be here with a film myself is uh, really exciting. It's an amazing festival and it's grown into basically a cultural behemoth. It's really exciting. This is, uh, unlike last time, this is our North American premiere. And so we're really excited to see what they think. We hope they laugh. Another producer, Nee Fishman in Toronto, uh, had the option on the book and he shared it with us and thought there'd be something interesting about that story and our storytelling sensibilities. As soon as we sort of got into the meat of it and who these guys were and what their interpersonal dynamics were, it was a story that seemed very familiar to us that was not unlike trying to start a film production company with your friends. You know, we're obviously not a tech startup, but uh, you know, we could identify with a lot of what these guys were going through, what happens when you have a little bit of success with your friends, how things change. Um, and so, yeah, there was something universal in that that we could relate to. It, it was death by a thousand cuts, I think, like a lot of people's projects. Like you start just with a, a, a fascination with something and then it just grew. I, I, in my mind, I never imagined that I'd be making a film about the Blackberry, but, but as I started seeing more and more things in my own life reflected in the story of these characters, it becomes, it became more vital that, that, I, that, I, that I do it. You know, you look at this cast list, Jay Baruchel and Glenn Howard and Johnson, it's a, it's a really solid group of people, really fun, kind, funny people with a lot of room to sort of play, uh, which I really appreciate. Even when you're tackling serious subject matter, you should be having fun as the filmmakers. I was having fun as an actor, but the character is not having fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> There's maybe like one moment in the film where my character smiles, you know what I mean? Like that, and that's it. Like it, it was, uh, but it, it's fun. I mean, he's a very volatile character, um, but I find that really fun to play. I like, I like volatility. I find it um, dramatically interesting to watch. And keep applauding because I'm about to introduce one other person who worked on Blackberry, director Matt Johnson. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Oh, what a treat. <laughs> no, 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 no. Come on, come on. No, no. Uh, let's keep it going for Glenn Howerton, who played Jim Bosley. Come on. Thank you. Wasn't that crazy? And another warm welcome for Rich Summer. Come on, Rich. And we're really lucky because there's a few very key members of the team who are in the room that I, I think should come up on the stage with us because they never really get the acknowledgement that I they agree. deserve, you know. Is that one of them? Why? What is that? What? <laughs> You're just happy they're going to be on stage? Love the team. Love the team. Well, the people, the people who, I'll do it in order, the people I love the most, okay? <laughs> First, the, my cinematographer who I've been working with since the very first thing I ever made, Jared Rabb. Please come on stage. When Jared and I were prepping this movie, we said, okay, let's make sure we don't do any zooms on this one. And you see how that worked out. Um, uh, up next, our producer, Matt Miller, who also co-wrote the film with me. And Matt, he's the boss. One of our other producers, a very important person in this film from Rhombus Media, Frazier. Ash, are you out there? Frazier, you here? Yes. And then the editor of the film, Robert Upchurch IV, is with us. Come on up. We call him Bobby. Anyway, thank you so much for staying. And uh, we're happy to talk about absolutely anything in the film. Uh, we've been making movies a long time. And one of the um, philosophies that we try to put into all the movies that we make is to kind of give a sense of how to make movies inside the movies. And so even though this is a film about smartphones and technology and powerful personalities, really it's kind of the story of my friends and I learning how to make movies and then how making films changed our own relationships. So if there's any filmmakers in the audience, like we're happy to talk about the filmmaking process. But if nobody cares about that, we'll just talk about <laughs> the next season of what It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs>
Which is coming out soon. It's going to be great. It's going to be a good one, I've heard. Yeah, yeah. A good one, yeah. You're I bald mean, in it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll start things off while you know, people uh, think of questions. But I, I mentioned before, I had no idea about this story. Like, total void. Is this something that's well known up in Canada? Did you know anything about BlackBerry? Well, I knew it as a product, and and uh, Mike and Jim are kind of famous in Canada only because we have so few major entrepreneurial celebrities. But what I loved, and I think what brought us all to this project with, was exactly that, that nobody knows this story and nobody knows the guys, which gave a lot of license for us to kind of create what their reputation would be for the rest of their lives. <laughs> I would also say Jim is uh, better known in Canada for his multiple failed attempts to buy into the NHL than for being the co-CEO of BlackBerry. Big time. Big time, because it wasn't just the Pittsburgh Penguins. He tried to buy the Nashville Predators, and he always wound up in court, always thinking very, like, very much the way Glenn is doing it, like, well, I'm going to win. I'm going to get it, and then every time getting shut down. And i got to tell you, those, I mean, well, this is being filmed. I don't know if, if our lawyers would let me say it. But I'll say that of all the things in the movie, the NHL things, those, those scenes where I would say the scenes where we took the least creative liberty. <laughs> Like, that was as close to reality as, as the film got. I mean, do you want to talk about the freedom that you gave yourself to deviate from reality, and even in the performances, like how much you guys referenced the real people, but how much you brought to the roles of yourselves? Uh, for me, um, I spent all my energy just playing the man that I saw in the script. Uh, I, I really did not... There's not a lot of video out there that exists of Jim Balsley, but I also wasn't really interested in trying to do a an imitation of him anyway, just because he's not that big of a public figure and it just didn't feel like that was where I wanted to focus my attention. Um, and also I knew that they'd done all the research and so I didn't have to do as much. Yeah, uh, full deference to research. That's it. <laughs> all right, I'd love to invite the audience to the conversation right here, sir. Yeah. Like, it's like, you know, you get in with these good nerds and stuff, but you're like, yeah, fuck yeah, like, you've got this, you yeah. know, and it's like, so I really love how, like, the, how you weird your character. The question was whether or not Glenn was basing Jim on people he knew. Yeah. Oh, God. Um... No, uh, I, 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 I actively try to avoid people like Jim in my life, um, I, I, I <laughs> but I, I find uh, people like him uh, just endlessly fascinating, like somebody who is just all hunger and ambition and just so driven and never satisfied and always hungry and always looking for the next thing. Um, it, it's, just, it's just so interesting to me. Um, I don't, I don't really know a lot of people like that. I've known some intense people, certainly. Um, but no, it, it's really, I, I, don't, I don't know, it's just uh, imagination. And, <laughs> you know, I, we referenced the movie Glen Gary, Glenn Ross. Um, that film, the performances in that film, um, I think maybe unintentionally influenced just sort of the, style or acting or something. I don't know, I, but it wasn't pulling from anybody specific in my life, yeah. That's another way of saying Thank he's you. just playing himself, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go up towards the back there, right there. Oh, 
Oh, right. You know, it's funny, it's oddly prescient, eh? Because I've, I've been coming to Austin since I um, brought my first film to Fantastic Fest in 2013. Whoa. Yeah, all the greatest, come on. I know, hey, we've got to give South by love, but Fantastic Fest is, is pretty crazy. And, um, and I knew right away this was a special place, just from the people I would meet on the street. And as I've been continuing to come to the city, I begin to notice that, it, 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 I mean, you're, you're a, a victim of your own popularity in many ways, that this place is becoming so inundated with people who are like, oh yeah, this seems like a cool place to be. And that's something that I learned in high school is that the cool table is only the cool table when there's only six or seven people there. <laughs> and as soon as the whole cafeteria joins the cool table, you're looking around like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> this isn't the cool table anymore. And um, yeah. That's definitely the way we feel making our movies, is that you can't have anybody join the group that's not like a, a good friend, because then you're like, what's going on? It's weird. I don't want these people around. Um, but certainly that is my philosophy. I believe that there is something to, I mean, th these are lines that Doug literally says in the movie, um, so I won't repeat them now. Um, but the, I think it's something that a lot of people in commerce miss, and it's that there is a kind of guiding principle in any organization that comes from something that isn't just working hard, showing up on time, and having good ideas. There is something intangible, something you can't define, right? And I think you guys tried to define it with just that sentence of keep Austin weird in, in the early 2000s. And I don't know what that sentence means, but it has something that seems true, that if you were to lose, this place would no longer be the same. And so I think that it's just constant rigor and realizing that that is an important value, even though it doesn't have a tangible or a monetary um, association. And so how you fight for that, I don't know. This movie is about it, and this company ultimately failed at it, but I don't think that that's talking about the inevitability of this wonderful city. Let's hope not. <laughs> I'll take, I don't want to ignore the top there. You, right there in the center, way up in the top. being kind to say satire. You mean we stole things. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> I get this quite, I mean, I've done a few of these festivals now with this movie, and they're always trying to find some euphemism. Uh, oh, I, I noticed that it was kind of a bit of a uh, uh, satire. Yeah, people who like the movie but are like, wait a minute. Yeah, we stole things. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Who else had questions? I would <laughs> actually answer. <laughs> right here in the jean jacket, who was one of the first people with their hands up. Right, yeah. <laughs> Well, he's very of its time, and it's something that we noticed because although we didn't talk with the real Jim or the real Mike, we did talk with a lot of ex-employees from RIM, and they all painted a very similar picture of the environment, which was, it, to me, I was never in these places, but it reminded me of like land parties or, or board game parties that I would be a part of playing Dungeons and Dragons in the 90s when I was a kid. And, and very gendered spaces like where the guys were like afraid of girls. Like we, we kept trying to, to reintroduce that idea that like when, when a girl shows up, they're like, oh my gosh, this is a major culture shift for us. And, and so that moment was something that was talked to uh, with us where it was like, oh, it, it was very easy to feel alienated as the only girl engineer in a lot of these places, which was certainly the way research in motion was until around 2003 or four when it really exploded and they started just hiring students constantly. But that's, I mean, we were just taking it from people that we talked to, but thank you. I think we have time for one more question. You wanna do the honors? Pick someone? Oh, sure, my question's actually for Rich. <laughs> um, that's not what he said, you need to listen to him. He said to, to, to let, you get to pick somebody. Rich has never seen the movie before. And so I'm wondering, like, what did you think? 
<laughs> no, 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 I wouldn't dare do that. Okay. <laughs> well, it's good, it's good. Uh, yes, right there, yes. That's, we've been shooting things basically with a handy cam <clears throat> that had a massive zoom on it from the first thing that we worked on. So we just got very used to the running around with a bunch of cameras not knowing what we're doing. And I think probably this is just an extension of us trying to stay as close to that as possible despite the resources and the infrastructure and needing to be a bit more you know, lo locked down and a bit more in a classic fiction world. But yeah, it's like... I think that, I remember an early conversation we had was like, it would be great if it just felt like these camera people had gotten in there under false pretenses, which is something we're very used to doing in real, like the real world and other stuff that we make. And we're just trying to get whatever they could out of this crazy office they found themselves in. And so that's where the idea of always having the camera like two rooms over, shooting through blinds and, mm -hmm. and that feeling of like, holy shit, I can't believe, are we, are we really seeing this conversation? Are we really? Yeah, the term we used is we were trying to make everything seem as though it was found as opposed to being placed. Because in a lot of, even the films that were being referenced, bef referenced before, like other films about this, these kinds of worlds, everything seems very um, orchestrated. Which, it, it really has a place and, and, and that's a beautiful style of filmmaking. But we are coming much more from a documentary aesthetic and we're trying to make it seem like this is only happening once, and we're all really lucky to see it. And not only does that forgive a lot of, um, like the chaos and the pace of the movies that we try to make, but it also allows for a kind of participation, I think, with audiences, where you kind of also feel like, oh man, uh, like, I can't believe we're getting to see this. Like, it kind of breaches the wall of privacy, especially for somebody like, like Jim. Like, it, it somehow, I can't explain it, but like, it, it gives you a kind of, subtle, almost subconscious feeling of, oh, I shouldn't be watching this. And that's something both Jared and I really, really love. And when it goes well, it does something that I think only movies can do. Uh, uh, magic can do this as also. Like if you're watching a really great magic show, then you're not only watching the story of the trick, but you're simultaneously going, well, how, did he, how does he do this trick? Like how does this magician do this trick? And I think movies are the only other art form that can do that where you can simultaneously watch the story and participate with its construction at the same time. And so that's what, what we're trying to do with, with our camera. I, I, I would also say, as a person who's mostly spent time on a more conventional set, this is my first time working with these guys, that, that uh, uh, sometimes when I would ask the question of where is the camera, and sometimes the answer is, don't worry about it. <laughs> and so you go, okay. Um, which gives a license to someone like me to just truly play the scene. Because if you are acting in a more conventional format, you have got to have two tracks going in your mind, a technical and uh, this sort of art of the moment. And here to have the technical part sort of handled by, by the guy I'm told is somewhere in the building, um, <laughs> it, it takes the onus off and you really do just get to, to play the moment, uh, which is a, a gift that these guys are, are giving the actors I mean, there would well. be scenes where I would be alone in a room and I was really alone. <laughs> and that does not happen on a film set. No. Like, there's usually, there's somebody in your face at all times, like, you know, somebody pointing a camera. We were afraid of you. What's that? We were afraid of you. We were trying we try to stay away from you, Glenn. <laughs> I, yeah, that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. I, uh, <laughs> but no, but it was fascinating because I, I could you, you would do I could do a scene in a room by myself and literally feel like, for, almost forget I mean, wouldn't forget but it, it feel it would feel like a rehearsal yeah because right there wasn't, it didn't seem like anything I was like would want to walk out off of a scene and be like did we shoot that like what was happening like and we, was and we also didn't just, rehearse really not which really. which which was I think also important for this because it meant that as soon as we were in a scene. The, the technical side of the film is so far away from, from the actors that it, I, I tried to make it feel as low stakes as possible. I got to tell a story about Rich that's so related to this, and that's that we're shooting one of these scenes that he's talking about, and this is like the second day of him being here where he still has, I have not earned his trust, all right? And, and we're doing a scene, and it's a, it's a big thing, and I'm kind of coming up with stuff as we go, and it's the scene where him and Sung Won are both uh, talking about um, 
uh, the fact that uh, Michael Ironside is a jerk and it's like, oh, he's going to fuck up your company. Sung Won, is, who's being hilarious, is like, that guy will fuck up your engineering department. And this scene was kind of being written on the fly. And uh, <laughs> I tell Rich, okay, we're going to do this. And I think you should walk up with Sung Won and, and observe this. And he's like, do I have any lines? And I'm like, oh, no, I don't think so. And then he turns to the sound guy and he's like, don't give me a microphone. <laughs> and that's why in the scene, he's only acting with his face. If you watch the scene, it's incredible. He knows he can't speak, okay? But he's in a conversation with an engineer trying to tell him, no, I'm serious. That guy will fuck up your company, really. And Rich is like, mm. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> yeah, because he's in a close-up. He's in a close-up, and he knows he can't talk. And you only get those moments when you shoot in this ridiculous <laughs> style. Because when we saw that, we were like, "Oh my God, this is cinema gold. <laughs> we can't believe this." Um, anyway, yeah, I embarrass myself. So I think there is a scene as well <laughs> where Carrie Elway is literally looking for the camera, and it's yeah. in the movie where he's no, looking. No, 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 no. He's no. not looking for the camera. He's very upset. Well, he no, he wants to make sure he's on camera. Yeah, because we, he, he didn't know where the camera was. The waitress in the room. kept blocking his eye line, yeah. and in the middle of the scene, he's looking and he's like, "Oh my god, this person's still blocking this." And it's in, it's in the film. You yeah. see him interrupt himself in the middle of the scene, but it comes off like. You know, he's just crazy. And that's when, that's when we cut to Jim and Mike looking at him like this. And, and Jay Baruchel goes, goes, what the fuck is he looking at? What? It turns around. <laughs> anyway, you get... Those, Kurt, the, the other editor who's not here, he's actually a screening of another film, has this great line that he always uses to torture me. Because I really, in many ways, don't know what I'm doing as a, as a filmmaker. But I'm, I, I really do love setting up environments where things can happen that are not planned. And he always, whenever we finish a film, will tell me, well, I only use the takes where things went wrong and you had no control over what was going on. And, and that'll finish our coverage of Blackberry. I hope you enjoyed it. We have lots more films to cover, so see you next time. <laughs>